Good afternoon and welcome to the Office of Economic Development Bonding and Business Insurance webinar. My name is Margaret McGee. I'm the Business Services Manager. Business services assist entrepreneurs and business owners in starting and growing their business. We help navigate through the different departments within city government to obtain permits and occupational licenses. We also connect the business community with organizations that can provide technical assistance, incentives, resources, and other programs beneficial in operating your business. A way we do this is host business information sessions and webinars. These sessions and webinars are held throughout the year and the topics are gathered from entrepreneurs, surveys, and the information we collect from the business community. Following the DBE certification business information sessions, uh, we held those in March. It was suggested that I facilitate a webinar on bonding and business insurance. So today we have Ms. Jill Tucker and Mr. James Richardson. Both are representatives with the Insurance Underwriters of Louisiana, uh, one of SBA's active surety bond guarantee partners and supporters. I ask that you please place in the chat box all questions and we'll get to them in the Q&A section. To keep down distractions, attendees, please turn off your videos and mute your speakers. All handouts will be shared within 24 to 48 hours after the meeting has ended. Now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ms. Jill Tucker, followed by Mr. James Richardson. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jill Tucker. I am an insurance agent and I work for an insurance agency uh, in Metairie, Louisiana, but uh, we have a surety bond division and I specialize in surety bonds um, because after today, you'll learn that bonds are very different from the insurance product. Um, and if you don't know a lot about bonds, you know, that's okay. Um, you have a lot of company, uh, the vast majority of people have no idea what they are. So hopefully you'll get a, a few takeaways today and uh, happy to answer any questions at the end. There are, there are many different types of uh, bonds, uh, but for today's purposes, we'll be talking about construction bonds. Um, and if you bid jobs, uh, public jobs over a certain threshold, you're required to have them. The purpose of surety bonds is to protect the person who's requiring them or the, the municipality or the general contractor, um, you know, contrary to what some people believe, it is not a product that protects uh, you, the contractor. You're actually purchasing it um, to protect the municipality from loss. So it guarantees the completion of the project and more importantly, that you're gonna pay everyone downstream. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, general contractors will require subcontractors to provide a bond uh, if it's their first time working with them, if the job's over a certain threshold, or if it's a specific trade, a uh, critical path trade, they'll get a bond to, to protect their interest. A bond is a qualification. Uh, it's a guarantee, again, that you're going to perform the work and pay everybody. It's a risk transfer product. Uh, the taxpayers and the municipality are shifting that risk to you and the, and the surety. Um, surety is usually a division of an insurance carrier. All the ones you're, you're used to hearing, uh, Liberty Mutual, Nationwide, Travelers, um, Hartford, they all have uh, surety divisions of their uh, insurance market. A bond is, is a three-party agreement 
that makes it different from the, the, the typical contract, which is two party. And uh, I have a model later to kind of sh show um, the parties involved. Surety credit, again, is, is not an insurance product. Uh, insurance uh, operates, they, they expect losses and they charge a premium based on those expected losses. You make a claim, they pay the claim and you're on your way. Uh, surety credit is more like bank credit. Um, you go through an application process to ensure that there is not gonna be any loss. If a surety thinks that there is any risk involved um, and that you'll default, they will not issue you the credit. So much like bank credit, if you don't pay the bank back the loan, they will you know, seize your assets to be made whole for their loss. The, the general indemnity agreement uh, is something we don't talk about very often. Uh, for bonding, you know you're required to sign it. What does it mean? Um, you know, exactly like it means for the bank. Um, you're going to sign corporately and personally. If you do cause a loss for the surety, if you walk off the job or you don't pay subs and suppliers, uh, the surety will will pay, will stand in your shoes, complete the job and pay everybody. But at the end of the day, there's an agreement that, that you'll pay them back if you're able. And I have a link here for more information about that because it is important for you to understand that, again, the bond is not your protection. It's actually exposes you more. Um, so you can make a business decision as to whether or not it's worth it uh, for you to pursue a bonded opportunity. This is a diagram that shows the three parties involved in the bond, uh, the contractor who's required to provide it, the owner, the obligee, or the municipality, Corps of Engineers, Sewage and Water Board, DOTD. They're the owner who is benefiting from, from the bond and in turn protecting the taxpayers. Uh, the surety is the entity that backs the bond. Um, again, they'll stand in the contractor's shoes. They'll pre-qualify the contractor. They feel comfortable that there's the contractor can complete the job. They'll provide the credit. And if there's an issue, uh, the municipality can call the surety and get them in to take care of everything. And uh, under this arrangement, it would be a general contractor requiring a sub to bond. So the sub would provide the bond to the general contractor to protect them from any loss. And again, you know, the surety uh, functions similarly in, in this arrangement. These are the common types of bonds. Um, in order to bid on a public job, you have to turn in a bid bond. There's no cost in the pre-qualification to get bonding, to get a program. No cost for the bid because you don't have the job yet. You can't charge for it. Uh, you, you'll, once you're pre-qualified and you get your bid bond, you'll know what your rate is. You'll burden your bid with that rate, not benefiting you. You can charge it to the owner. Um, and then supply and license bonds are, are less common, uh, but we do provide those. These are the most common types of bonds. This is a, you know, this is an important question. How much do bonds cost? Again, bid bond, no charge. Pre-qualification, no charge. Uh, so there's really no downside for you to reach out to, to a surety agent and just say, look, you know, I'm, I might bid public work if the right job comes along and just make sure. So we're not, you know, operating, reacting and operating under duress to, to get it done. Uh, no downside to getting that process started because it is a lengthy process. There's a lot of information uh, that you have to provide. Uh, the, the performance, the premium is due when we provide provide the performance and payment bond. Um, both of these go hand in hand, typically. Uh, the performance bond is, is say, stating just that, you're gonna perform the work or the surety is gonna come in and do it. The payment bond is stating that you're gonna pay everyone downstream. Um, you know, sometimes I, I, I wanna point out too that there, you wanna know who's on the job uh, you want to know the third tier subs, you want to know all the suppliers involved, because these are companies that 
can make a claim on your bond. If your second, if your first tier sub does not pay us their supplier, um, you will be, you're on the hook, you're exposed for that. So that, that's important to know how these uh, products function. The typical charge is half a percent. These are for large mature construction companies that are doing audits who have done successfully completed a lot of bonded work or on the lower end of this range. The first bond is typically gonna be 3%. Supply bonds, license and permit bonds are 1%. The surety bond rules, this gets confusing um, because there's a lot, of, you know, there's different people and partners involved in the process. Um, I am the first person that you would meet with to gather the information and make sure it looks as good as it can when we go to the decision makers. Uh, the underwriter is someone that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I would submit your paperwork to them. If you're a regular user of surety credit, you'll meet that underwriter. Um, they're local or you know as close as you know Houston or Dallas. The surety is the actual um, entity that it, it's, it's their paper. They're, they're the company that's backing, uh, backing the product and, and going to stand behind it. Uh, an agent, a uh, surety bond agent specifically, is someone who specializes um, in surety and knows the marketplace. Uh, again, it's different from insurance. So the typical insurance agent um, probably doesn't know the, the ins and outs of it or know, you know the proper markets to approach. So you want to make sure you, you have some, you find someone that has experience. Um, they're not just going to, you know, there to, to give you the product or get you credit. Um, use them as, as a resource, a uh, trusted business advisor. Find somebody that you trust and like. If the first meeting doesn't go well, you know, move on. Um, I know in the beginning you might not have that much leverage or um, consideration, but it's really important. You're going to work with this person. You're going to trust them with very sensitive information. You need to be able to talk, you know, have difficult conversations with them and, and feel comfortable with them. Um, source for market intelligence. Um, I, IUL has probably 15 to 20 different surety markets. Uh, it's important to know which markets fit uh, the appropriate exposure. Um, you want them to be able, they're, they're your mouthpiece. They're, they're representing you. So you want them to be professional. Uh, you want them to know what the surety needs in order to get you credit. Uh, Cause this person is operating on your behalf. You want them to understand your vision and be able to clearly, you know, convey that to the decision makers. We're going to strategize uh, about business decisions. Again, um, you know, it, it's a, we're, co we're communicating, if you go to buy a large piece of equipment, um, you know, you want to call your agent first because decisions like that affect uh, surety credit. So we can talk through that. Um, I'm here to give you advice, not tell you how to run your business, but every dollar that goes out of the company in cash or working capital that goes out of the company is $10 worth of surety credit. So, you know, you want to strategize about those decisions and take them seriously if, if you need surety credit. And uh, there's another link for you that we can share. Uh, again, the underwriter, the individual that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis um, and that would, would, we would introduce to you, you'll have a meeting, you'll know, you'll know them as an employee of the surety company. Uh, they're going to review the records that we submit to them and um, consider my recommendation uh, or your agent's recommendation um, as to why they should uh, approve you for surety credit. Uh, we're going to de determine whether or not you qualify in general and we'll establish uh, a, a size, a single limit bond, um, uh, single size bond limit and a total program. Surety company is regulated by the Department of Insurance. They have to submit their financials uh, to the insurance department, just like you have to submit your financials to them because the municipalities want to know that they have the financial wherewithal to stand in your shoes if a claim is made. 
they're legally responsible um, if for some reason the contractor defaults. So they have to have uh, adequate amount of capital. How do you obtain bond credit? Uh, the, the first thing that we do is run credit. Um, so there are certain thresholds that have to be met in order to get bond credit. So we'll, we'll run personal credit. I, I believe that threshold is around 600. Um, but, you know, uh, what is driving the credit is important as well. Uh, surety is a very relationship driven industry. Um, so it's, there's always a conversation. It's not typically uh, a definite no. It's like, well, what's, what's driving this? You know, let, let's hear more about it. So um, don't be um, discouraged if your credit falls below that. Uh, if there's a story that we can tell to the surety, uh, that would be helpful. And then also there are other programs uh, to help us out as well. Contact a licensed surety bond agent. The next step is to apply for a bank line of credit uh, in any amount. Uh, we want to see that that the bank has underwritten you and feels comfortable with you. And also that in case you get hung up on receivables, working for a municipality that is known to be slow pay, um, that you have access to capital if you need it to pay subs and suppliers and keep that job going. Very important, make sure you have the appropriate insurance in place, make sure it meets the, uh, the, the bonded contract, it meets the specs, um, because if it, you know, if, if right off the bat you don't have the appropriate insurance, then you're in default of the, of the contract. This is the information we need in order of importance, really. Uh, the questionnaire is an application. It tells us who owns the business, if you have any affiliates, the largest jobs you've completed, we want to know the people involved. This is really important. Uh, it's not all about dollars. Uh, it's about trusting the people who are running the company and their capability. Business plan, just like the bank asks for the line of credit. Uh, we'll check references. You know, it's important to get a feel. Um, you know how how the community sees you uh, and the construction industry. Uh, we'll get your company and personal financial statements and a work in progress schedule is a very unique component to construction accounting. Uh, that's actually uh, where our exposure is. So we want to be able to track the jobs. Uh, your agent can provide you with a, an Excel spreadsheet and walk you through how to put that together. Again, bank line of credit agreement is really important and uh, insurance as well. Um, this is the textbook of our qualification process. Uh, my first day on the job, this is, this is what they tell you. You're looking for character, capacity, and capital. And uh, what does that mean? Character, transparency, you know, sometimes, it, it, you know, it's just a feeling when you meet with somebody. Um, you you, you want to have that trust relationship right off the bat. Again, your reputation. Um, I think everyone in here is local to New Orleans. Uh, I am as well. Uh, it's a small city. The construction industry is even smaller. So you all know as well as I do, um, if you're not doing things the right way, you know, that, that gets around real quick. Um, your conduct and again, your, your credit report, uh, because history tends to repeat itself. So poor personal credit can be an indication of, of future uh, poor, poor payment. Do you have the resources um, to, to take on the work? Uh, do you have the format that we require? Uh, again, construction accounting is a bit confusing. It's different from traditional accounting. Um, I would say that the format that you provide to us is just as important as how much money you have in the bank. Um, so, you know, have, having those properly, um, you know, submitted is really important. And, you know, at first it's, it's probably not going to be. Um, what we're looking for, and that's okay. You know, it's just a starting point. You're probably going to have cash or accrual based statements in QuickBooks. Um, we'll get those and then we'll work through it and we'll get you converted to the, the proper method. We're looking for working capital. Working capital drives your program or your surety credit. 
working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. Um, and that is that number right there times 10 is the amount of surety credit traditionally um, that that you qualify for. So if your cash and your um, receivables is 200,000 and your your, your 50,000 in your line of credit and your payables are 50,000, then you have $100,000 of working capital. Times 10, that would give you a million dollars of surety credit. Um, what are your payment terms? If, you, if, if working capital is a little shy of, of what you what you want to go after, um, we underwrite the job. Um, you know, maybe we don't have the cash to finance the job, but if you're working for a an owner such as the Corps of Engineers uh, or the VA hospital has net 15 payment terms and you have pay when paid with your subs and suppliers, you're not coming out of pocket. So you don't need as much cash. Those are things we look at, you know, specifics of the job as well. And then your cash available to, uh, to make payroll and, um, and, and fund, fund the job if you need to. Um, this is a really important slide because all of that was traditional underwriting. Again, there are tools out there. Um, you know, if you get started uh, and, and you don't qualify um, for traditional credit, we have the LED bonding assistance program, and they will pledge collateral to the surety on your behalf, which makes it a lot easier to get credit. Um, and then the SBA bond guarantee program, which is great. And it's only it's 0.6% fee. Um, you burden your bid with that number. I have not seen a bid lost uh, by that margin in a long time. Um, so it is worth um, the guarantee and the amount of credit you get. I believe, um, if I'm not mistaken, their uh, limits are six and a half million single, over 12 million total program. So, so that's a lot of credit, you know. Um, again, you know, if you're new, if you have a bankruptcy in your past, you want to go after a much larger job, um, and your bank line actually counts towards working capital. So, um, we did that calculation earlier. If you have zero working capital, but you have a hundred thousand dollar bank line. There you go, we're in business. So, um, and then there's also something called funds control, funds administration. Um, it's typically a 1% fee and it mitigates the surety's uh, payment exposure and a third party would administer the funds. So these are the tools that we use um, and I use on a daily basis to get there uh, if we're not there yet in the traditional sense. And, and this, is, oh, this is to be used you know, for a period of time and then you typically graduate out of these types of conditions. Again, your bond cost and what drives it. Um, the smaller bonds, the, the first bonds, the smaller ones are usually two to 3%. Um, information is less important. Your personal credit is really driving the approval. Um, and then when you start to get to that million dollar range, we're gonna need more information. We're gonna need more professional information. Um, but once we get those CPA statements, we can reduce the rate. Bonds over a million dollars, we're getting those CPA statements. They're required. So we can typically reduce the rate even further. So the higher the, 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 higher the value, the more exposure we're taking on, the more information we're going to need. And bonds are important um, because they allow you uh, access to opportunities and your opportunities are what drives your growth. Uh, that's all I have. And I think um, James is going to take over and do the insurance presentation. And any questions you have, we'll, we'll, we'll both answer them after uh, his presentation's over. Thank you all. Thank you, Jill. Now we going over to James. Okay, can we see that? I assume yes. so. Yes. Yeah, okay, yes. good. All right. If you thought bonds were exciting, wait till you hear about insurance. 
Um, we are going to talk about, and, and with the people that were signed up, it's kind of all over the board. So I put together a presentation that's going to talk about a few different things. One, the current market environment in Louisiana for insurance, property and casualty insurance. Uh, two, just some high level talk philosophically about insurance products and, and what's out there. And then the last half will be how to purchase insurance, the best way for you to reduce cost and what do we mean by reduce cost and how are you gonna get the best outcome from uh, your purchase of insurance. So those are the, the three things we're gonna to try to touch on as we go today. So let's start with where we are. We all live in Louisiana, so we are dealing with tough times in the insurance market. So that's called a hard market. And what we have are hard markets and soft markets. A hard market occurs because of many different reasons, but obviously with our property market, it's a lack of capacity where a, a Lloyd's of London provider maybe two or three years ago had $2 billion of aggregate to put out on the street, meaning all right, a $100,000 building and a $50,000 building and a million dollar building, add all that up, that's the aggregate. So these, these providers had a ton uh, of ammunition to put out there on the street and to write policies. They don't have that anymore. You add that to the rate increases that have come, then you have a lot less competition in the market and that leads to a hard market and the pricing spikes that we've seen. So with auto, let's talk about two different kinds of insurance when we're talking about a hard market, auto insurance and property insurance. So those are the two that are really causing problems in Louisiana right now. So you as business owners, if you have automobiles, if you have a fleet of automobiles, you've noticed that pain over the last few years. Now that happens because of direct reasons in Louisiana. We have a lot more litigation than some neighboring states. We have different types of litigation. We have social inflation and nuclear verdicts. That happens everywhere, but the social inflation is something that's that the industry is really keying on. And what that is, is you have a uh, someone that gets rear-ended and maybe in 2019, that particular injury is a, a jury will award $30,000. And now in 2023, that same injury, a jury is awarding $50,000. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just what the legal system provides. And as those costs creep up, it filters down to you, the end user, of course. Now, property insurance is a little more nuanced. And if you see my graphic there, the insurance company, when they write property insurance, in most insurances, they buy what's called reinsurance. So if, if they have a lot of losses, they're backstopped by their own insurance policy that they're purchasing. The problem is the international reinsurance markets where you buy this stuff, it's a global market. So just because Louisiana gets hit by Ida, it's not good for us. But what I explain to people is the real hammer was the next year when Ian hit Tampa. So if a hurricane comes through Louisiana, that's bad, but it's as bad for us if a hurricane goes through Tampa or Houston or something like that, because the property damage in billions of dollars on the international market is so much worse with something like that. Or if you hear about a typhoon or a tsunami or something in Asia that, that wipes out a city of 10 million people. That is all factors into the global property market. And that's why we don't have as much capacity and we don't have as much competition because if you have a limited capacity, you're going to go spend that capacity in places where you're not going to be so at risk. And we do not uh, factor in there. The other two on the, the last point down there at the bottom, yeah, you're having rate increases and everybody is, is, saying that that's the reason their property insurance is going up. And yes, your rate's going up. So maybe three years ago, you, your rate on your commercial building was a dollar, meaning $1,000 per 100,000 of insurance coverage. And that is 
changing. So now maybe that dollar is two dollars and it's doubled. So every hundred thousand dollars your commercial building is worth for rebuild value, now you're getting you're paying two thousand instead of one thousand. But the other double whammy there is the the insurance carriers figured out after after the last couple of years that everything with this inflation you've seen over the last three years is very much underinsured. So what they're doing is they're saying this building, this metal building, we used to be able to rebuild it. If it burned down, we could rebuild it for $55 a square foot. But now it cost us $1.10 a square foot. So not only is your rate doubling, but what you're insuring is double. So that's why people are getting the sticker shock in the property market in Louisiana right now. And hopefully that's going to plateau at some point. But as of right now, it hasn't. Um, since we do have some startups and some people that have been in, in the industry for a while, in industry for a while and bought insurance, we'll just kind of set the table here. So what, what do you have to have? Um, from a workers' compensation perspective, you're going to have to have workers' compensation if you have employees. And a big misconception out there is, oh, I have independent contractors. They're not my employees. That doesn't matter anymore in the world of workers' comp. If they're doing work for you, they are going to be considered your employee because if they get hurt, they're going to file a claim on your policy. And that's all well and good. But when you get to the end of the policy period, they're going to audit you. And every 1099 independent contractor you're using that doesn't, you don't have a certificate of insurance for, they're going to put it on your workers' comp and charge you for it. And you're going to have 15 or 30 days to pay that uh, overage with the audit. So be careful about that. Just assume everybody that you write a check to is going to be an employee in the eyes of workers' comp. Uh, liability insurance, you're going to want to have general liability insurance. It's, it's needed, but you're, you know, where it's required is when you're entering into contracts, uh, especially on, in the contracting realm, uh, when you're getting a lease, if you have a retail business, if you have office space, all these things. But it's a no-brainer to get it. It's not always required. Property insurance, we've been talking about. Lenders are going to require that. The SBA is going to require that. And you're going to have to insure to a certain threshold based on, on what you're lending to. And lease requirements, again, for your office space or your retail space, you're always going to have some sort of property requirement 99% of the time. Here we're talking about just uh, different types of insurance. If you're a large entity, you're getting more into risk management and more into a thorough review. We talked about commercial property insurance, but a piece of commercial property insurance that we haven't talked about is business income or business interruption. So common misperception, especially in South Louisiana, of what business income or business interruption is there for. It, it was a, a big problem after Katrina and a big problem nationally during COVID as a lot of people tried to file business interruption claims for COVID. And there was specific wording in all policies that, that none of that type of, of contamination was covered. So it's created a lot of litigation. But with us, with hurricanes, I just like to teach people business interruption is not there because the hurricane came through. We didn't have power for a week. Uh, there's a 72 hour waiting period. There's a lot of accounting documentation you got to put together. So that claim where you, after the 72 hours, you missed a day or two of being able to open your business, it's going to be more headache than it's worth for you to file that claim. Now, if it stretches into a month, you know, then, then you can think about it. But if your building is damaged, that's what it's there for. If that hurricane it makes your building where you can't use it and you can't conduct business and you need to keep your employees paid, then that's when business income is there to kick in. If you have a fire and it's going to take you 12 months to rebuild the building and you can't operate until then, that's what it's there for. So just try to educate people that it's tough to think, oh, I was closed for two days. I missed a couple of big parties. I need to put this out for my catering hall. Tough to do that and tough to substantiate it. So just know what it's there for, and, and you can do that cost-benefit analysis of if it's worth it to have it on there. Uh, general liability, we talked about directors and officers. So if you have multiple owners, if you have a board of directors, if you have these things, that's a directors and officers exposure. If somebody makes a decision that costs uh, the business money, costs an individual money, they, that's might be a directors and officers claim. 
So becoming more and more common, even with smaller businesses, professional liability, errors and omissions. So that's going to be your, your accountants, your engineers, folks like that. If they make a, a, a design flaw, then that is a, a professional liability claim. Uh, cyber insurance is another one that most people don't think about because traditionally people think of cyber insurance as I'm not housing anybody's credit card information. I don't really need it. But now you're getting to more of this ransomware and third party type things where they come in and shut your computer down unless you send them $30,000 and you don't have access to your database. You can't conduct business. So that's becoming more and more of a hot button topic. We talked about workers' compensation, flood insurance. Everybody in New Orleans knows flood all too well. EPLI crime and fiduciary, EPLI is employment practices liability. So that's things like sexual harassment, uh, things with hiring, wage and hour. So those things pop up. And the most important thing to, to remember about this slide is things like employment practices liability and crime, fiduciary, ENO, DNO. These things aren't in a general liability policy. Common misconception as you grow your business is that I have a general liability policy. It covers all these things, but that's not necessarily the case. And you need somebody advising you as to what your exposures are in these areas. And if you need to pick up additional coverages for those things, because we're trying to make sure that the assets of the business are secure. So is it worth it to pay for these additional coverages if you have that exposure? So we're in Louisiana. The big claim is hurricanes and floods. That's what happens here. So we have to deal with it. Um, that, those are going to be what people want to talk about. But you also have to get into the other, other uh, things that are out there. Workers' compensation claims. Your employee is injured. The difference here in a workers' compensation claim and these other types of claims is, okay, uh, my employee hits somebody from behind in the automobile. That claim could be a $30,000 claim. That claim could be a million dollar claim. You don't know how that judgment's going to go. With workers' compensation, it's determined by state statute. So if your employee is injured, they can get up to 60% of their salary. If, they, if their hand's severed, that's X amount of dollars. It's all set out in the statute. So there's not a lot of gray area there. So workers' comp is a little bit easier to wrap your head around. With liability claims, you have auto insurance claims that we that we're talking about here, hit from behind. Premises liability, if you have a retail store, or someone slips and falls, that's bodily injury. That's a, a liability claim. And then an operations claim that if you're producing a product that uh, could injure somebody or cause property damage, that's an operational claim. If you're a contractor and doing work, Again, kind of a gray area in that if it's your work and you just do faulty work, is that going to be covered by a liability policy? Maybe, maybe not. You might need some professional liability to cover that portion of it. And I put this graphic on this, uh, this slide to go back to the property damage and the discussion we had before of, of what's more important, uh, where it hits or if it hits us, and both are important. But the big thing here is, yeah, Katrina is the big dog because the levees broke, all the flooding damage to go along with the huge winds and the big swath of area that it went through. But I point this out because Hurricane Sandy at the bottom was the one that, uh, when it was a very small, uh, not, I think it was a one or a two, went up, but it went up to the Northeast and it hit the big population areas the big expensive property areas, and it drove up $84 billion of damages, even though it was a, a very small and not that, that violent of a storm because it hit a high property area. So that affects us. Um, the important of risk, importance of risk management. So we talk about total cost of risk. It's an insurance buzzword that nobody that... It's not in the insurance business wants to talk about. But what we're saying is we're going to look at risk in a different way. And it's not just what our premium is. So what can we do to, to handle risk? One is avoid risk. You're a contractor. You don't want to take on the additional exposure of putting roofs on. So I'm going to go get an insured sub to do my roofs. I'm not going to use 
my employees because they're just not trained for that. So you're avoiding that risk. You you can retain risk and self-insure if it's something that you know you you have five employees but you don't feel like it's worth spending five thousand dollars for an employment practices liability. We're all remote. There's very little chance there'll be any sort of harassment claim or something like that. Okay, well I'm not buying that. I'm self-insuring it. If that claim does pop up, then it's the assets of the business that are exposed for that claim. It's the legal cost that you're going to have to incur for that claim. So it's the decisions that you make. And then risk transfer is insurance. You're transferring a premium to an insurance company so that they will pay a claim in the end. Now, here on this slide, we talk about frequency and severity. So I like to educate on purchasing insurance here because this is an important topic. You, the part, the, the reason you're purchasing the insurance for things that are not going to happen very often. And if they do, they are so severe that they could affect the, the company moving forward. And if it's going to be able to move forward because it, if the assets are exposed in that, in that point. So we want to guard against those type of catastrophic uh, claims that can really hurt a business. On the frequency side, if it's something that happens on a day-to-day -day basis, you can't throw that to an insurance carrier all the time. If you have 15 car washes that you drive through, there are going to be 10 people a day that say you dinged my car or something like that. You can't have that as an insurance claim all the time. Your, your premium would be just astronomical. So we have to learn what we're purchasing insurance for and what we're filing claims for so that we are a good insured and a good investment for an insurance carrier to take. Uh, finding the right provider. So there's a couple different ways to, to go and purchase insurance or have it procured for you. Direct, if you insure your vehicle with Progressive or Geico online, that's a direct rider. If captive, that would be a state farm, all state. They only represent one carrier. They, they, uh, that's when you call state farm, you're going to get a state farm quote or they're not going to be able to do it. And independent, that's what we do is look out in the market and bring whatever to the market. So not saying any of those are better than others. Some of them may be, but it's, those are the options out there. Uh, you also want to look at the financial stability. You want it to be an A-rated carrier by AM Best. Best AM Best has been around forever. They they do a good job of rating. You you A want to be with an A-rated carrier because they're going to be there after they have some claims. And B, if you're entering into contracts, things like that, a lot of times it's going to require that you have an A-rated carrier by AM Best. Demo Tech is a new one. We see it a lot more on the personal line side, but they will be rating for commercial carriers here too. Very easy to get an A rating through Demotech, but a lot of these uh, contracts won't honor that Demotech A rating. So just be careful of that and try to make sure you're with an AM best A rated carrier. Um, people still want to use an advisor. So most of the data they give us is about, you know, 70% of buyers want to bounce it off of somebody. They'll go online and do the due diligence, do the research. But before they press that button, they say, no, I, bet, I think I want to know what I don't know because it takes a long time to, to learn everything in the insurance cycle. So that is still a way most people want to, do, to have that, that advisor still involved. Uh, and recommendations from your peer group, from your niche. If you're a plumber, you know, you want to talk to other plumbers see if there's somebody that operates in that in that niche that does a good job for other people. And that's usually a great way to evaluate it better than just a Google search uh, for plumbing insurance or something like that is, uh, you know, you talk to your peer group on a regular basis. So ask that question. Uh, should I be getting a review? Yes, you need to get a review. If you if you sit back and, OK, my premiums aren't changing too much. The agent's just sending me the renewal every year. And you look up in five years and you have expanded your business exponentially from a growth standpoint. You're doing a lot of different things. 
you don't know if that stuff's covered. You don't know if it's accounted for in the application process. You don't know about an audit. You might have written the policy when you had a million dollars of gross revenue, and now you have $10 million of gross revenue, and they want to do an audit this year, and they're going to 10 times your premium out of the blue. So you have to have that constant communication with the person that is in charge of, of your insurances so that they know, yeah, it might cost you a little bit more in the short run, but you're spending money on this insurance. So make sure you have the correct policy that it's covering the correct things. And the only way that's going to happen is through communication. Now, these last couple of slides will be, okay, we are purchasing insurance. We're, we are business owners on this call. What's the best way to do that to, from my business's perspective? So trying to look at it through your guys' shoes, give you my industry knowledge of how things work. So you're not going to shop your way to better, uh, better total cost of risk. You may shop your way to a better premium one year, but that's not going to work consistently. So we talk, we're talking here about there's no silver bullet. There's no, uh, that's because with these hard markets, we just don't have a lot of options out there. You, you don't have a ton of carriers that want to write property here or want to write auto here. So, you know, if you go to five, I'm going to shop this thing this year and get these premiums down because this is crazy. So I'm going to send it to five different agents to quote it. So well, all those five agents, 90% of the time are going to the same carriers. There's only so many carriers that will write here. So put yourself in the, the shoes of that underwriter and you're seeing it five times. You know, you're going to put up a red flag. So shop for the right insurance advisor that you think is doing a good job for you, that's communicating with you, that's bringing you options on a regular basis, maybe not every year. If things are flat for a year and nothing changed, okay, that's fine. But we're at least communicating about it and they know your wants and needs. As far as into specific lines and how to, to affect your premium. Property, wind tiering is obvious. Tier one's below I-10, tier two, I-12, up from there. So farther north, you're going to be the better outcomes you're going to have. If you're going to put a huge warehouse somewhere and your options are Grand Isle and Franklinton, pick Franklinton. It'll save you a lot. But, you know, it, if you're a small business and you're just trying to put your office somewhere, is it going to make that big a difference? No. But if you have a huge property exposure, yeah, it'll make a difference. New construction and a new roof, that's going to make a lot of difference. Uh, so if, you have, if you're trying to relocate and you're going to buy property, newer the better, newer roof the better. Willingness to have skin in the game. The terms, another thing that's gone that's hard right now in this hard market for property are the terms. So whereas you might could have gotten a 2% deductible a few years ago for when, now you're only being offered 5% deductible. So you're taking more skin in the game now than you were previously. Construction types are a big deal. A frame construction is, is just the carriers do not want to see frame construction and they especially don't want to see 40 year old frame construction in New Orleans and Jefferson Parish. It's habitational, like an apartment complex or condo association. Those are out there everywhere and they, they have exploded in premium. So older frame, not good. Non-combustibles like your metal building. So that's a step up. That's a little better. Joisted masonry is going to be center block building. So as you go up and have better construction classes, the more options you have on the property side, more carriers that will want to write your risk. Uh, separate entity to own real estate. So if you're a small business, if you're a large entity and you have a bunch of trucks on the road and big GL policy, big workers comp policy, that carrier that's writing that stuff will find a way to write your property. If you're a small business and you have your operation, but you bought your building or maybe bought a couple of buildings, you might want to move that to a separate LLC and just segment that risk from a liability standpoint and from a property standpoint, it might end up being better for you. Consult your tax people, consult your attorneys, but from an insurance standpoint, I see it a lot. It helps because then I can take that operation and segment it and make it by itself. And that gives usually more options for that business side of it. On the auto 
lines of business, ways to reduce costs there is difficult because there's not a lot. If you have a fleet of a few vehicles, if you have a couple of vehicles with your business, you really have two or three options. <laughs> there's not a lot that will write it. If you have a fleet of vehicles, you got a few more options, but it's still not a ton. So what I tell people is you got to look internally and make yourself the best risk that uh, an insurance underwriter is going to see it and say, this is a good risk. This is going to save save me some money. So I want to you I want to write this risk, meaning you're doing a great job on the HR front. You're asking the right questions. You're running MVRs. You're using technology to your advantage. You're getting these GPS systems that are tracking drivers, and you're not just tracking them. You're actually having some consequences for bad actors and and suspending them or getting rid of them, and that you have uh, dash cams. All these things you're doing have to be communicated to the to the underwriter so that they know you're doing them. So that's that's where the communication with the agent comes into play again. Workers' comp is the one outlier for Louisiana. It is a soft market. There are a ton of workers' comp carriers that want to write business. That's your one place where you can make a little hay on the money saving uh, from a premium standpoint right now because it's so competitive uh, in the workers' comp market. These guys are are announcing rate decreases all the time. So, you know, that one might be worth taking a shot at and looking at if you have a substantial workers' comp expenditure. You know, if it's just a few thousand dollars, the change is not going to be worth moving around. But if you're if you're paying six figures in workers' comp, you can probably, you know, over the last few years, that should have come down. And also your experience modifier, that is showing you know, what your premium, your claims, you start at a 1.0. If you, this is something you can control. And, you know, if you have, if you have a good outcome, you go down to a 0.9, a 0.85, and you get a credit on your, your workers comp. If you have bad outcomes and go over one, then they're debiting you and they're adding premium. So the, the claims you have, can affect your premium directly with workers comp. And that's a good thing to know. And you wanna work with somebody that can help you through that and how to do it. General liability and excess liability is kind of, it, it, it's ticking up, it's a little hard, but it's not a super hard market for that. So your GL should stay, you know, you're probably seeing five, 10% increases on that. But the, the what I like about this graph is it explains band pricing. So with these, like this first trough here is a soft market and then it spikes and that's a hard market. And the point of it is you're never going to have in that soft market one outlier way up here that's like it's in a hard market or in the hard market, you're going to have somebody that's 80% less than the rest. They're all going to be in that tier because they're all getting their reinsurance from the same people. So everybody's going to stay in that tier. What you can control is where you fall in that tier. So you, if you're a best practice organization, you can be here at the bottom of this tier. If you're having trouble having claims, you might be at the top of that tier. So you want to stay away from that and just work to make how you look as a best practice organization as good as it can be for our, uh, an underwriter that's taking a look at it. So to wrap it up and just say, especially on this cost containment portion of it, find a broker you trust and let them do work. Uh, you'll know if they're doing work for you by your outcomes. If you feel it's not being done, then interview brokers. Don't, don't say I'm going out to five different people and we're gonna plaster the market. See who you wanna work with, make sure they, they know what they're doing. And then that will take care of it for you if they have your best interest at heart. Um, if you have the right broker, you'll see all the options in the market. You, you're not gonna you're not gonna hammer one underwriter with a bunch of submissions because when they see that, they're like, this person's not serious. This person's just throwing this out there to any agent that'll look at it. I've received this same submission five times, and it's different every time. They're not communicating right. I've got a desk full of submissions. I don't have time to deal with them. They're going to push it to the side. We want one to be top of stack. We want to be the only one they have. We want all the information, photos, background, narrative, boom. That's the one that's going to get the attention first and going to get the best pricing. So we don't want to be 
in the rat race with the churn. Uh, engage in the process, help the broker paint that top. Why are you a best practice organization? You're spending money on software for your fleet. You're spending money on your HR department to weed out the bad actors. You're doing all these things, but nobody knows that if you're siloing it and, no, and not communicating it. So they need to know that so they can paint the picture and get you the best premium. Um, and then plan to reduce exposure, minimize claims over time. That, that's what it is at the end of the day, that pricing band we just talked about. If you're a best practice organization, you're going to be at the lower end of whatever the market bears at that point. If you're having claims, if you're having late pays, if you're having all these problems, you're going to be at the top of that band. So whether it's a soft market or a hard market, you want to be at the right spot in those bands. So that's everything. Still awake, Margaret? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Just had to find that pause button, that mute button. Um, so thanks, Jill and James. Uh, we'll now take questions. Um, when I call your name, um, you could unmute yourself and ask your questions. I see here we're going to start with uh, Mr. Eugene. Question I like to ask is, uh, on joint venture shorty bonds and the advantages for DBEs and small businesses? Yeah, um, those can be very advantageous. Uh, you know, the purpose of forming a joint venture is to share resources and share risk. So you get the benefit of the large, a, a small business would get the benefit of a large partner's surety bond program. Um, so if, if they're willing to use you know, their program to support the joint venture. Um, if the smaller party doesn't qualify, um, that, that could give you access um, to large opportunities. And so it can facilitate the growth of your company. Um, I think the, the biggest concern or thing to keep in mind is be careful who you, um, you, know, you know, who you team with. It's all about finding the right partnership um, cause it's, it's a marriage, you know? Um, so, and, and keep in mind as well, they need you as much, if not more, um, than you need them. I think we lose sight of that sometimes. Um, they're getting access to opportunities with less competition, uh, that are traditionally more lucrative. So, you know, when you're negotiating things on the front end, I mean, that af after that, you know, there, there's, really no room for negotiation. Um, keep that in mind, you know, you wanna maintain control. You're the majority, um, you have to be to qualify. So just, just remember that when you're negotiating those kind of deals, um, but they can work really well. I've seen, uh, I've seen some work very well and set small companies on their way um, to getting bonds on their own. Um, I've, I've seen a few go bad, um, I'd say, when they're bad, they, they go, they, they're really bad. So just, you know, just be careful. Uh, hey, Mr. Eugene, I see you have a couple of other questions. What is, uh, what is the cap on the SBA bond guarantee program? And I, what, are, what are the caps on offsets? I think that, um, I think it's six and a half million single, 12 million, total. Um, I know that they were trying to pass a bill um, because of inflation to increase those parameters. Um, I'm not sure if they were successful, um, but I'll have, to, I'll have to look into that. But at least they're at least six and a half single 12 million aggregate. Um, keep in mind though too, I've had, I've had an issue um, where some small businesses took on a partner. Um, I think you can do that large businesses can invest in small businesses 20 to 40 percent and they can still maintain their small business status. <laughs> um, but that kicks them out of SBA uh, because the SBA bond guarantee program is going to look at the large party's revenues 
and those are going to count you know, towards, um, towards that company's revenue, and we're not going to have access to the SBA program. So that's something to keep in mind if, if someone wants to take a, a larger company wants to take ownership in your company. My third question is, and I'm asking this question because I've seen it happen here on uh, capital construction projects. The 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 uh, it, whether it's important that you have an OCIP to subtend your bond from the owner or prime on a capital construction project, because what happens with that is that sometimes you come in and bid with a prime, and he says, well, you know, I, I accept your bond, and then basically the the project is in is in process, and then a couple of months later he says, oh, you know what, um, I forgot to tell you this. Uh, we got we we got to break off uh, a couple of thousand or three thousand or four thousand dollars from what your uh, agreement on this particular project is on on you know what whether it's uh, whether you're putting in uh, a lump sum or not. So we have to we have to break this off your lump sum because uh, we have to put an OC OCIP in, and that is basically going to hurt us because of the land of the project. But I will think that if, for instance, if you're doing something like an airport project, you would have an OCIP with whether it's the uh, airport or the state, uh, in, in case of people who don't know what I mean, the OCIP is the Owner's Controlled Insurance Protection Plan. And sometimes people have it air side and land side. So if you go into uh, uh, um, um, and writing a contract out and that particular stuff is not uh, is not spelled out it, it, it hurts you so question i'm asking is is it is it is it okay that your bond your bonding company basically asked that particular question so that you're prepared before you sign before you sign your bond over on a project um i am not sure what the relationship is between an osip and a bond um but i can say in general we are going to base the bond, the bond follows the contract. So whatever your contract states, I mean, that's that's what we're gonna follow. And I would think that's what everyone should be following. Um, now James has more experience with OSIPs in particular, so I'm not sure if he understands this question better than me. Uh, yeah, the OSIP, I mean, I don't know how it would react with the bond, but it, it's basically, uh, insurance for the owner as a uh, from a liability standpoint and but the the bond would react to make sure the project goes forward the OSIP would react to see who's at fault I mean maybe it sounds like Eugene is saying that he signed a contract and given the bond and then they've come back and asked for him to provide an OSIP um yeah in general contract terms, I don't I don't see how that would be legal. I would push back on that if it wasn't in the contract to begin with, if right. I understand correctly. Does that answer your question, Eugene? Yes. Okay. I think I'm looking at the comments. It looks like it's all Eugene. <laughs> well, we have one more, Mr. Williams. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a pretty simple question. Uh, last year, my small business worked on a number of contracts. One of the clients required that I have liability or professional insurance. The contract was for a one single day activity, a training workshop. But I ended up buying insurance for an entire year. <clears throat> is it possible to purchase that type of insurance for a single day of work or for a shorter period of time than one year? Because I only needed it for that one client for that one day out of the entire year. My first incl inclination would be, yes, you can do that. Um, there's several providers, uh, direct providers that do event insurance. It would just kind of depend on the, the parameters of it and what they were requiring of you. Um, you know, if if it's if it's pretty 
standard stuff, I would say, yes, there, there are some providers that can do that. If you want to email me after, I can give you a couple of those. Outstanding. And by the way, I cannot see your information um, while we're talking. So I wanted to make sure, um, will you all be sending this information to us, to our email addresses? Yes, I'll, I'll definitely send out uh, the presentations, which include contact information for both James and Jill. I'll send that information out within 24 to 48 hours. That's outstanding. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, James. You're welcome. Okay, so our next question is from Ashley. Um, Ashley, you can ask it or I can read it, but are there any loopholes to workers' comp insurance for the state of Louisiana? It's very hard to get, and I have had clients that require it. Um, they're not loopholes per se. I mean, it's, it's a pretty cut and dry coverage in that, like we were talking about, it's statutory. So, you know, if a, an employee gets hurt, it, the re, and look, the reason there is workers comp is because what they didn't want to have happen is every time an employee got hurt, they had to sue their employer for their, their injuries. So that's why they devised workers comp. Workers comp is supposed to be a very liberal coverage that covers, you know, if, if you're doing it and you're working and you're injured, it's workers comp. They don't want to do anything else. And because of that, it's pretty much set in stone that, that these are the coverages that are provided. Now, as far as it being difficult to acquire, um, it's the only time it's difficult to acquire that I see is kind of when you don't have any prior insurance. Sometimes at that point, no, the carriers don't like to write it because you don't have a track record. They can't see your lost history. So a lot of times in that case, you have to go through an LWCC or a uh, fund and it's a little more pricey that way. But once you're with them for a couple of years and you have some history, then you can kind of go to some of the other carriers as well. But that would be my suggestion is probably if you're having trouble locating someone that will write it is to try LWCC and, um, and see if they can hook you up with, with an agent because uh, LWCC was, was started by the, Louisiana legislator back in the 70s when there was a workers' comp crisis, and they basically write most risk, most class codes. So I hope that answers the question. It does answer my question. Um, so the reason that I asked, and I, I, I came on to ask live in case this can help anyone else, I we have a small business, so it's not a lot of employees, but the client that we had was just requiring us to have workers' comp, despite the fact that it was just a requirement for that client. Um, and so when we went to go through insurance to get the workers comp, we got no after no after no with insurances to write it. And then someone finally said, hey, go through LWCC. And so when we went to do that process, that's like an eight month long process. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so technically, um, it, it's, that's why I asked if there were any loopholes because I get that. Yeah. I mean, in I mean, my mind, it, it's gotta it be something not, else. It shouldn't take that long. They're not the, they're not the fastest in the world, but, but they can usually get it done in a week or two if you have all your information. <laughs> so, but. I ended up having to, to, to be completely honest. I ended up having to use, um, one of my other businesses and get work was just through another state and get workman's comp through another state because like you're saying a week or two, but I'm telling you, I still don't have it. And that was four months. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. So, I might call LWCC directly and maybe work with, with somebody different. So. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, I, I was just wondering if it was something that I was missing. Cause it's, uh, it's I think, up. I think you're on the right track. It's just taking a lot longer than it should. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Anderson. Hello. 
Yeah, we can hear you, but we could barely hear you. Uh, we'll go ahead and just ask the question. Um, do you have a list of insurance companies that can write short-term insurance coverage? If if it's um, if we're talking about uh, like the uh, the question from before, if it's just like a short-term event, uh, I'll type it in here. K and K insurance.com. So this is where um, I send most of my clients if they have a single event that they want to insure or maybe have some requirements that they have to have for, for a single event. Um, that's usually a lot more cost effective than me writing them a, an annual policy for something that is not really part of their business. Um, it's just a one-time thing they're going to do. So that's, that's a good website that can be a direct writer. You just put in the parameters of the event. They'll send you the, the policy. And if you need a certificate or something for somebody, they'll send that out for you too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, what forms of insurance are usually re required to apply for bonding credit? Um, whatever is uh, required by the contract. Um, so for bonds, we just want to make sure you're meeting the specifications in the contract. Um, if you can give us a certificate that shows the coverages that you're required to carry for the bonded contract, we're satisfied. Okay, and the second part of that is, do you have any suggestions for finding an umbrella policy? We've been having a hard time finding a carrier. Yeah, the umbrella market is is a little hard um, right now. There's not, they, they had some loss problems the last few years, so there's not as many carriers that are writing it. They're still writing it out there. Um, you know, if you have a contract that requires a $5 million umbrella, that can get a little, little harder, but there, there are ones out there you need to have, you know, the best way to have is your, your underlying coverages are, are clean. So your general liability is clean, your auto is clean. I mean, from a loss perspective and that, you know, there's no uh, issues there, then they're going to be more apt to put an umbrella over the top of it. But that's really what you need to do is, is we were talking about earlier, paint the picture. I need this umbrella because I have these jobs lined up that require it. These are the, the risk management practices I have in force. These are the things I'm doing from an HR perspective. This is why I'm a good risk. And, you know, it's not just we shot it out to a couple of umbrella carriers and they said no. You know, do some due diligence put the best face forward and, and let them know what you're doing, why you need it, why you're a good risk. Okay, did that answer? Well, he said his mic is not working. Okay. <laughs> um, so the next one is uh, actually for you, James. Please ask James if he can provide a list of companies uh, to write WC insurance other than LWCC. Okay. Um, so there's a ton of carriers that will write in Louisiana for workers' comp. It's totally different than auto and property where they're very few. Um, you know, there's, there's Luba, Summit, Amtras, Traveler, CNA, Liberty Mutual. There's just, I can't name them all. There's but there's a ton of them, LCI, um, Treen. There's just, there's so many of them. Uh, I, could, I would leave them some out if I did. It's really, I would say, you know, LWCC is sometimes higher than other carriers, but what you got to watch out is don't cut off your nose to spite your face. If LWCC also has a very good dividend program. So if you've been with them for quite some time, don't forget about that nice dividend check that you get during the policy period, because you may say, oh, I got my LWCC renewal in, look how high it is. And I went and got a quote from so-and-so and it's a thousand dollars cheaper. Yeah, that's great. But don't forget about the $3,000 dividend check that you got during the course of the year. 
So factor all those things in. But as far as, you know, if you if you Google workers comp in Louisiana, you'll see a million different companies. If you're in contracting, the home builders have a program. If you're in restaurants, the restaurant association has a program. So, you know, there's there's a ton of options for you out there with workers comp. Okay, do anyone else have any questions? Don't be shy. Okay, so if, feel I'm free sorry. to reach out to us if, if, if y'all think of something, you know, after the presentation, feel free to contact us directly. Yes, thanks for that, Jill. So if there's no more questions at this time, um, I want to thank everyone for joining today, especially our speakers for their very informative presentations. Within five to 10 business days, this session will be available on the Office of Economic Development YouTube channel, along with previously recorded sessions. Remember to check your emails for any upcoming sessions and webinars. As always, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you.